Let's suppose that you were able every night to dream any dream you wanted to dream. And that you could, for example, have the power within one night to dream 75 years of time. Or any length of time you wanted to have. And you would naturally, as you began on this adventure of dreams, you would fulfill all your wishes. You would have every kind of pleasure. See. And after several nights of 75 years of total pleasure each, you would say, well, that was pretty great. But now let's, um, let's have a surprise. Let's have a dream which isn't under control. Well, something is going to happen to me that I don't know what it's going to be. And uh, you, you would dig that and come out of that and say, wow, that was a close shave, wasn't it? Then you would get more and more adventurous and you would make further and further out gambles as to what you would dream. And finally, you would dream where you are now. You would dream the dream of living the life that you are actually living today. That would be within the infinite multiplicity of choices you would have, of playing that you weren't God. Because the whole nature of the Godhead, according to this idea, is to play that he's not. The first thing he says to himself is, man, get lost. Because he gives himself away. That was the writer Alan Watts talking, and the video was of an artwork by today's guest, Rafiq Anadol. Both Rafiq and Alan Watts are in that video, exploring the nature of dreams and of memories. Rafiq was once quoted as having asked, can computers dream? And whether they can or can't, I think the question is a good indication of the ambitious scope of Rafiq's work. In many regards, Rafiq is one of the most significant contemporary artists alive. He is a pioneer of data art, a kind of work that, through the intervention of algorithms and quantum computing, creates the kind of work you just saw. That work, titled Melting Memories, was part of the most recent Florence Biennale, where Rafiq was also awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award, and yet he's only 36. On the podcast, we discuss his work, his process, and the digital age in general. I hope you like the episode. For me, algorithms, data, or specifically machine intelligence is a very natural part of our near future. I mean, it's already our now, like currently we are, the tools we are using, the, the machines we are using, the, the systems, the softwares, the social media, like we are constantly surrounded by, you know, machine decisions in our life. We generate our own data. We witness data in different formats and data is all around us. So I never actually imagine life or near future without all these elements. But also from the art perspective, I couldn't also imagine myself not speculating and missing this invisible world around us. I think that was the very first impression 2011 when I make my first data sculpture. It was just that feeling like making in invisible visible. Mm. And it's almost in a sense like you're not creating an artwork with the kind of personal biases that you would see with uh, another type of artwork, but rather you're giving lenses to your audience so that they can see the digital world. Exactly. It's a kind of like, um, some people is calling it portal. Some people calling it as 
a kind of an alternative world around us that we just don't feel it, but just some see it, but we know it's there. Um, and then sometimes I feel it's like a wind, right? Wind patterns. We know we don't see a wind, but we feel it, right? When it's just, you know, a breeze or like a fast wind or like, you know, a storm. And like, we know that around us, the nature always in motion, the particles around us, the world around us, like molecules and proteins and like uh, our cells and neurons. I mean, from the micro to micro, like I think the motion is always in our life. Um, I feel like these algorithms and data context is always making that invisible visible. Do you specifically go for that sort of hallucinogenic aesthetic then? Because it's kind of tapping into that idea of an alternate dimension that we can't necessarily see all the time. Yeah. So I think that is a kind of a very interesting um, journey. I can maybe briefly explain about it. it. It was So my journey with data started almost 10 years ago. And it was just 10 years ago, I was just dying to like really make the invisible visible. And then last, like between 2011 to 2016, that five years, I worked with like wind data, social media, APIs from Twitter, um, Instagram, JSON files in different scales, um, Wi-Fi signals, Bluetooth signals, like things around us that we know that exist, but we don't see. Um, and then 2016, something magical happened. And this is a very grateful moment in my, I think, journey. Google, artist and mission intelligence team, was doing an incredible, actually, auction in San Francisco. And they were auctioning the very first AI art to give back to the community, a nonprofit organization in San Francisco. And I was very lucky because 2014 November, we were able to get our first physical three-dimensional data sculpture in the center of 350 mission, a building lobby, uh, a beautiful large screen, a media wall embedded into architecture and a three-dimensional corner turned. And they saw it and they said like, wow, like this is a, something that they didn't think about data can take a form in this architectural scale. And my journey with them started. And in that event, I was the only artist who didn't use AI but dying to use AI <laughs> because in my talk, I was talking about like Blade Runner, science fiction, near future scenarios, like Philip K. Dick um, speculations and William Gibson and so on. Like I was constantly like talking about, you know, machines can learn and, or if they can learn, can they dream? And I was saying in my talk that machines most likely will not dream. They will most likely hallucinate mm -hmm. because a human will interpret and interact with it. And they love it. And they invite me to become the first artist in residence at Google. Was it quite hard, obviously because your work is so dependent on technology and high budget uh, technology, I imagine, was it quite hard before you'd created your first data sculpture to really uh, visualize what these works were going to look like? In general, I guess over the years, we made many tools like data plotting became a everyday uh, practice. So it's not like something hard to just plot the pulse of a data, normalize it, you know, just have a look at different perspectives from a different time domain, uh, look at different roles and CSV to like, um, to JSON files, to XML, to like, you know, DBs, like different like databases. Like we just worked with really, really diverse um, data sets over the last 10 years. So I got used to like kind of sometimes like what that data may mean versus how the data can become abstract. Because mm -hmm. in my work, my hope is not to like recover data. It's never the intention. I never worry about like make the data visible or readable at all. Because data visualization as a design practice is very common. And I know that those people are very speculative, like, like didn't like this idea of like, oh, wow, he took data and make it something like completely not understandable. And I, I know it's a crime <laughs> from the perspective, but it's intentional. It was always intentional, like get out of like the boundaries of data. So it's interesting. You're not making the data easier to decipher. You're just almost giving it a personality or a character in a, in a similar way that like, you know, humans aren't necessarily easy to understand uh, in the same way your data is, but we have all the uh, complexities and uh, psychological ambiguities and you really get that sense in your work as well. And it's always like, I mean, especially after AI, right? 2016 was a breakthrough because I was really looking for speculating the consciousness in my work. 
work. Um, I know it's a dangerous keyword and I know it's a scientifically not still <laughs> quantified universe of our nature, but I'm still very struck. Like, I think technically I'm just enjoying our cognitive capacity, like our learning and remembering and dreaming and hallucinating and imagining like this kind of like our cognitive abilities are becoming the our, like, obsession, I guess, over the years. Um, and I love that AI was an inspiring approach to these narratives, to these concepts, meaning I could make a thinking brush and I could paint with machine consciousness because machine consciousness is something we can quantify for machine consciousness. We can put a certain information mm -hmm. and put in a certain conditions and make that test in a much more controlled environment than a human environment, <laughs> which multi-sensory and the past and the future and the memories and lots of other dimensional thinking so it was much more have a clarity for me to use AI in the context of consciousness. Hmm. I was looking at your Melting Memories project. Could you explain what that work was about and how you went about generating that data sculpture? Yeah, so I think it was 2017. I was in Istanbul and I came from, you know, California. I was so excited to open Archive Dreaming project 2017 in February. And I was so excited, like, wow, like coming from US with all the AI knowledge to Turkey. And I'm so proud of like sharing with my friends and saying, hey guys, like come here, like there's this, you know, AI practice. It's just exciting, you know, in my practice. And I was of course excited to share with my family. And the day I arrived in Istanbul, 2017, again, end of February, I guess last week of February. And I went to my home and I saw my uncle in the dinner. And he just asked that, where am I coming from? And I'm just, yeah, I'm USA, like in Los Angeles. Like I, I went to it like five years ago, like <laughs> just, ah, he forgot it. And my uncle is my like kind of father because after I lost my father, my uncle was like my, you know, second father in life. Like, you know, who you just, you know, take over that responsibility in life, incredible relationship. And it was so heavy to me. And, and I was just coming with all this crazy, amazing technological advancements in life. But my uncle was losing his memories and it was stage one Alzheimer's. And I went back to LA. I remember very clearly it was, it, it touched me so heavy. And I said like, okay, how can I make something about this? How can I like take a human memory in a way without breaching the privacy? How can I like celebrate the moment of remembering? Um, I emailed several friends at UCLA where I teach and research, um, and I found an incredible neuroscientist, Professor Adam Gezeli from University of California, San Francisco. Incredible mind, and he has been researching with his team at NeuroEscape, doing wonderful neuroscientific research about the plasticity of human, human, um, um, human brain, and he was actually creating games to help human uh, mind conditions to, to cure problems and, you know, disease and so on. And I asked, like, very openly, like, can you please help me like to find the moment of remembering? And thanks to him and his team, we got an incredible information about how to like look at data from a mind and how EG use it's a it's a very brain. And we use a two-channel EEG device to get the signals. And we also mix it with a significantly large data sets from the UCLA and then use AI called EEG Learn. And look at the moment of remembering, like what happens, which kind of patterns of electricity a human mind may make, including myself, my team members. We went through these tests and like checked the AI's <laughs> predictability. And we very basically visualize the moment of remembering in the form of AI data painting and sculptures. It was a kind of a one year of research, 17 May, 2018, uh, spring, heavy push, heavy push. And then... It was remarkable and the, and the show enjoyed by the audience. People like reflect their memories, I guess. They found connection with the piece. I thought that people like reflect their best of their life, worst of their life. They reflect their identity, you know, and psychological conditions to me. Like I got 40, 50,000. I don't like, I don't want to like lie, but my Instagram was just about personal, beautiful notes. And, I, and that's the day, honestly, I felt that my work is touching someone's mind and someone's soul, like someone's heart. So that was a very powerful moment in my practice. 
Melting Memories is one of those. So it was uh, essentially brain scans of people when they were trying to remember things. Is that correct? And then correct. And then it was like a memory research, memory research database. And did you did you show anyone? Did you show the artwork of someone's memory to the person whose actual memory it was? Did yes, anyone... of, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and what we, and, we just... and what did they think? What were their reactions? So honestly, I personally, myself, <laughs> my wife, my team members, we went through all of us <laughs> through this. <laughs> it was like a very, um, sometimes heavy because some of us, I think, remembered not the best memories and some of us uh, like try to focus the best memories. And I personally try to remember best day of, best day of my life. Like what is that day? Um, it's a very heavy question and it's not easy to answer. And what is, if you had to answer it right now though, what would you say? Back in time, I guess, after I lost my father, I guess 2000, and I remember my dream that I saw him again, but that dream was so real, so like almost like reconstructing himself. I was so... I can't forget that feeling. It was the most epiphoric, like the most positive morning I remember in my life like oh my god like can I make like contact with someone not living with us like that feeling like, like that surreal mm. moment but at the same time it took only a couple of minutes like oh my god it is just a dream I guess I always enjoy like playing this game with my mind and imagination like the limitations of our cognitive capacity where reality starts and ends and our construction of cognitive like capacity of things in life, well, it was like a kind of inspiration. Mm. I carefully played inspiration, I will say. It's a mind and it's a way to be careful about, of course, but very scientifically, I guess. Uh, it's beautiful. To what extent is the aesthetic of your artwork dependent on your intervention with the data? I mean, what kind of rules and controls do you put in place to prompt the data to generate something visual? Great question. So. Again, before machine intelligence, before AI, um, I was pretty much abstracting a lot of information in different scales. For example, wind data paintings. It was a very inspiring start for me, 2012. Uh, I was a student at UCLA, Design Media Arts Department, where I was trying to get my second MFA degree. And I'm deeply grateful for Casey Rias. Um, he is a pioneer and a fantastic mentor and a mind who started processing with Ben Fry. It's a software that allows you to create your own code to think, imagine creatively by writing a JavaScript, a code that can do things you wish in your own creative capacity. And for me, learning that software and understanding the capacity of a custom software that you can write that allows you to like explore information was remarkable. So I started speculating, can data become a pigment question? That was, almost, that was almost the moment you got your technological paintbrush you could say correct correct yeah. um, because one year before i was aware of using sound data and transform the sound information three-dimensional surface but it was a very like a temporal data i mean basically very architectural frozen information wind is something in flux in movement there's direction there's gust there's speed there's temperature and air pressure and so on right I started to get much more deeper into that context, 2012. And then, of course, I tried to invent concepts such as what happens, the wind itself becomes a kind of a brush. What happens if the wind speed and the direction and the gust carves a surface of a painting and by paint it? And this is like, that's how I started, I guess, imagining. Kind of like And a then sand. over the years, of course. Kind of like a sand dune like, almost. Sorry? Correct, like a sand or like an invisible volume of mm. blocks of beautiful particles. But I think particles is always in my work. I don't know, like since 2009, I guess, like eight, in my early years with my motion graphics, like I was obsessed with particles. Um, and since I learned about creative coding and visual programming languages, like the first goal to is like, you know, particles, like particles to reconstruct something and mm. meaning. And the second algorithm I'm inspired is fluid dynamics. I'm in love with water. I am in love with like motion in life. 
and I love like this viscosity of things in life and mm. and how dynamics inside fluids are inspiring. And we are made of water at the end, right? As humans. Mm. And I think I find water very poetic in life in general, in you know the the, the ocean, the, the sea and the lake or anything like in rivers, like. I am in, enjoying the water in life in general. So that's why I found a very poetic to use fluid dynamics for more than 10 years in my work. Mm. And lastly, noise algorithms. I, I believe noise algorithms are one of the most inspiring machine randomness and brings machine decisions to surface. Um, specifically, Ken Perlin's Perlin noise. I think it was 2011 when I you know, remember his code, like a 46 line of code that, that allows me and many of people to reconstruct mountains, you know, the sea surface, the clouds and like landscapes. It was just a, for me very godly. Mm. Um, but the question was, of course, 2011 and 12, how I can reconstruct a mountain or a tree or sorry, a mountain or a surface of a sea by using data. Like, can I transform data into those landscapes? Can data become those spaces? Uh, was a very early experiment, I can, I can say. Mm. Um, and lastly, of course, AI. AI means massive de decisions, specifically generative adversarial networks, GAN algorithms, invented mm. by Ian Goodfellow. Uh, again, thanks to Mike Taika from Google AMI and my mentor. He was a fantastic mind who led the way 2016. And I start using machine hallucinations, mm -hmm. which is allowing machine to learn from uh, big data of images, most likely, and transform them into a dream state or hallucination state. That's not, that's not real, but looks like real. Mm -hmm. I love that state of ambiguity from the machine's mind. Uh, are you trying to find the sweet spot, though, between your intervention with the data and letting the data speak for itself, so to speak? I mean, is there a point at which you say to interfere with this data would make it less an objective observation of the digital world and more the creation of a human? It's a great question, but I think it's a pure collaboration. I mean, I cannot say the other way because I mean, very openly saying, like when I train an AI neural network in some capacity, and when I try to like understand what it learned and what can it reconstruct, it's a moment of like collaboration. Mm -hmm. And and I think many artists working with AI, like Mario Klingemann, Memo Akhtan, Helena Sern, and many, many fantastic artists who is exploring this similar space, I think we are in a like, very similar path. Like there's this machine generating this beauty or potential beauty. And it's just in this, this unknown journey in the mind of a machine in latent space. By mm. the way, latent space is an incredible concept of mathematical space. When machine learns this information, it stores in a space called latent space, which is a manifold and dimensional environment that is very abstract. Um, it's, almost like a, it's almost like a limbo. Exactly. We cannot see it, but we know it's there and we can plot it and we can, you know, go there by certain tools. Mm. So that's why, for example, almost uh, four years ago, we started writing an algorithm to just show us the latent space <laughs> and like, you know, put a camera in the mind of a machine. It's fascinating. It's kind of like if I had to describe your work to someone, I'd say you're almost like the... It's almost like you're the pollen to the plant of technology. You're kind of uh, activating technology so that it can sort of spread its wings, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's fascinating. There's I mean, also in general, my, my really... Yeah, sorry. sorry. Sorry, you go on. I, I think it's just really... There's this very interesting feeling I remember from a childhood. Like when I go somewhere in the nature or somewhere on earth... You know that you are very far away from others' friends and say like, hey, come here. I found something like that feeling that, that, that finding something new and fresh and then bringing people there. That's kind of a feeling. I mean, I, I'm seeing this pattern a lot with, with friends and colleagues who have been like practicing with AI. Um, the early, early practitioners, I'm not like later. Um, but there's a very this common, common trend like there. Like it's just a, a mindful trend. Mm -hmm. Hey, come here. Like we find something. Do you want to like feel it and see it? Mm -hmm. um, you know? And there's also a real sense of truth in your work. And I know that sounds cliche, but uh, because you're using data points and information, your work doesn't really have the personal biases that a typical artwork would carry. And it's almost like you're, yeah, you're, you're not, as, as I said before, you're not making up an image, but rather you're sort of changing the way we view objective truths. I think this is coming from a very urgent expectation from myself, meaning I want to make art 
for anyone, any age, any background in the world. And, and I know this is a very pretty intense idea, right? It's just kind of inventing any language, like the mathematics or aesthetics. And I feel like aesthetics is one of those language can, you know, unite us, connect us. And because I was like, into this, of course, there are incredible artists who have been practicing with activism, bringing very heavy and very powerful messages through like politic views and very powerful works about, you know, a certain activism again, which I admire and respect. But I feel like the world is already full of negativity. The world is and the people have already going through some very, very heavy things in life. Why am I bringing another like a negative to here? Why am I just bringing something, another like a bad things or like a negative feeling? In fact, why am I not bringing beauty and positivity, inspiration and looking forward? And I, I found myself always like much more functional and purposeful and impactful if I practice in that utopic world, positive world. And I think that's a feeling that I can, I, I'm very, ex- I feel very connected. Yeah, I feel the exact same way. I mean, I just sort of feel that, I mean, political work has its place, obviously, but I feel that uh, when you sort of align with your work with a political idea, that's all it can ever represent. And it's, uh, it can't transcend those ideas. And it's sort of the greatest artists, I think, um, their work is apolitical. Um, but yet it still speaks to something so uh, deep and meaningful to the human condition. Um, did you know? Did you know that the internet has a physical weight to it? Physical weight? Yeah. How 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 do we measure it? Well, because the electrons in data obviously carry um, weight, however slight. And apparently, if you added all the data of the internet together, uh, then it would weigh as much as an egg. And I was quite startled when I read that because I'd always thought of data and technology as something completely intangible, uh, an illusion almost. Um, does that change the way you view data? No, I mean, I I am just really trying to be sure that, like, I hope every single day we can touch our own memories and dreams. Like, that's a that's a dream I'm going for. <laughs> like, and that's why, and and assuming it's a form of like data, it's a form of art that that like really um, resonates with me, like a touching a memory and dream. I hope one day will be that weight, that materialization of that moment. But I just found that so startling because I'd always thought of it as, you know, this ephemeral thing that, you know, is always an illusion. But then but then to think that, I mean, you'd be creating more, um, you'd be contributing to the weight of the internet more than almost anyone else in the world, I would assume, except obviously like big tech. <laughs> I mean, it's another like a very interesting take because I found myself working uh, one of the most inspiring people in the world, very openly saying like, I'm, I'm very grateful for my collaboration with these uh, beautiful people. Um, I think it's a privilege. I don't see many artists be able to do that. Like I was able to work with uh, Google engineers uh, who have been like paving the future of like AI, work with the people who are creating the quantum computer and the quantum computation with AI. I've worked with like people at Intel who have been pushing the like computation and different level NVIDIA friends who allows us like push the AI like next level. I mean, we taught NVIDIA's true support on GPU computation, computer graphics, AI. We couldn't achieve this level of like practice. So I'm very grateful for these collaborations that allows us to go beyond what is available for humanity. Mm. I'd like to talk now about your work from the NGV Triennial uh, Quantum Memories, which we were talking off, offline about before. Could you describe that work for the listeners and explain how you went about creating it? So first of all, I am deeply grateful for the entire opportunity to NGV and deeply grateful to people in Melbourne who saw it and sent amazing messages. Like, I'm not lying from December opening to the like, end of the show. Every single morning when I wake up with a beautiful message, with some excitement with just young generation enjoying in a different way. I mean, like any level of age and background, I mean, just, it was just remarkable. It was beautiful. And, and, and to be honest, that's when I feel it's an art. 
like when you when there's that connection happens when people share that notes that's to me art or at least if it's not art what is it right like i mean that's like the, the like that's the moment so i'm from that perspective very very grateful but of course Triennial is a very important event for artists and designers. It's a remarkably important um, curator, curatorial decisions. And I was deeply grateful 2018 when I met with uh, uh, Simone and the senior, uh, one of the curators and, and, um, and, and Mr. Tony, who I've been like there for with a beautiful vision. I was just honored, deeply honored. And I'm like, of course, yes. And, but in three years till the opening, I was just thinking like, what can be the next big idea that we can enjoy celebrate the imagination but also understand near future and thankfully google ai quantum team ellen ho reached me literally like the weeks i was just like looking for what can it be and then just like hey we are google AI quantum team and we love your work we like like thing and you know communicate and enjoy like quantum computational and so whoa that's it that's it because for me, quantum computation, quantum physics is an incredible, um, incredible moment for me to say that it's probably one of the most major breakthrough for humanity, quantum computation. Could you and explain, where it can go. Could, could you explain what quantum computation is? Yes. So as we all know, like our everyday devices and machines that now we are using the, I mean, classical computer is using like a bits and bytes, right? One and zeros, which is a very fundamental computational language that every machine needs to compute. But quantum computation is using a very different world of um, physics. In that universe, first of all, a subatomic universe where the information can be measured through literally subatomic universe. And in that universe, things are not only in a one and zero, it can be in the multiple states at the same time, which allows engineers to compute data much different scale. While Einstein and many genius people have been struggling to explain <laughs> such a complex you know, superposition or um, in, in, in general, when quantum measurements happen, still there are things uncertain. While mathematics and I guess science allowing us to make it as certain as possible. But for me, what was much inspiring is based on an incredible um, theory from Hug, Hug Everett's, um, a California based uh, early, early 60s, he said, uh, he, he coined a theory called many worlds interpretation. And what, what was what that? Sorry, was proposed, just kind of many worlds interpretation. Exactly. In a very high level, in every single measurements of a quantum state may open an alternative dimension, may open a new dimension we cannot see, but perhaps it exists. While nobody, you know, prove that that works but at the meantime nobody say or nobody prove it it doesn't work so it's in this limbo that i found fascinating but the question is we always need machines right in life we need glass we need like you know vr we need a microscope we need a telescope to see space we need a microscope to see ourselves we need nuclear imagining to understand our body our mind we always need machines to world the, to see the world beyond us. Mm. And I think, I thought, what kind of a machine can be visualizing this universe? And thanks to Google AI Quantum Team, that was speculation that I worked with the fantastic uh, engineers to speculate this. To make this happen, Google AI Quantum Team in 2019 achieved a remarkable success called Quantum Advantage Research, which is using... 53 qubit computer here in Santa Barbara, and they were able to compute a problem in, a, in, in minutes versus thousands of maybe days and years may really? happen in a yeah, classical computer. Wow. Which is called quantum supremacy, I guess, or advantage, um, to be careful on the word choosing. And the 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 inspiring thing is like this happened in time and space in, in the world. And I said, like, can we take this data and use it for our AI to make 
alternative dimension visible. That was a pretty interesting idea. And it's like, well, okay, that's, that's, that's interesting. And I said, what happens if we use nature? Because the science is trying to understand nature, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got a direct concept. And I love nature, I mean, more than ever. And during pandemic and so on, like we start like collecting data of 200 million nature photos, like landscapes, water, fungi, trees, flowers, species, clouds, you name it. And then every single probably uh, major or well-documented national parks in the world was included. And then we train this AI and let this AI to run its conditions on a quantum level noise using unique bit strings from the quantum computer experiment. So technically, that specific moment in time will not be ever happen unless that computation happened in time and space. And that bit strings was a key in this work, alternative dimension. And that's how we create these nature hallucinations from the quantum computer. So two questions. With quantum memories, that's not on a loop, is it? That's constantly original, constantly new. Uh, some part is in a loop, some part is constantly. Like it's a mixed, it's a and, mixed state. And so in order to be able to generate uh, that visualization uh, in an original way and uh, without being in a loop, you needed quantum computing uh, to be able to do that on to to crunch that data on such a high level? No, the quantum computer only used once for the supremacy test from the Google right. team that already compute that data already. What we use another supercomputer to run the AI. Mm -hmm. And when the AI runs real time, we fed this quantum computational ah. result to it. Right. Still, we have a supercomputer. I mean, a very, very pretty, pretty strong machine with a next level GPUs and so on. And the screen that we used was a 10 meter by 10 meter remarkable screen by NEC. And just, I mean, it was a dream canvas. Like, okay. I mean, honestly. How much does a screen like that cost? That's one of the most beautiful screens I've ever seen in my life. That seven figures we are talking about, that, wow. that was not a normal experience at all. And I'm, again, deeply grateful for mm. um, this such a unique experience. I mean, that's what, you know, that sublime scale and really, the beautiful like courtyard. I, felt so connected i really hope they do keep it in that central part in the ngv because it's just such a oh, it's incredible um when you approach a company like google or a research team at like stanford university or wherever is the idea of making an artwork a funny thought to them i mean when you collaborate with someone is it usually the first time they've thought of what they do in an artistic way uh, i mean in general I work with the people who appreciate imagination. I guess that there's this common pattern. And it's not so hard to, you know, imagine people who have been like practicing in such an amazing mindset. I'm seeing a very similar pattern because these are the people enjoying imagination and looking for these, you know, exciting questions. And by the way, sometimes science is very rigid and they have like a very concrete walls and rules and regulations. And sometimes it puts the scientists in a way that like they're in a, you know, ultimate journey of like certain sharp clarity mm -hmm. and and sometimes i feel like when an artist comes with these questions that maybe not fit to the nature of research but it just opens up a new kind of a curiosity and it's a new kind of a new dimension um that happened to me a lot like when i talk with these wonderful people that we are collaborating and just discuss these ideas seeing their face in a very beautiful positive way and then like enjoying their like knowledge and experience and try to reflect back what they know and and these are beautiful moments in time. And, and, and that's one of the reasons that people are saying, like, who is your favorite artist? Like, I don't have a favorite artist. I have a favorite scientist. Mm -hmm. I have people that I admire because of their, like, you know, function and curiosity in life. I admire them more than artists. I'm sorry. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. that's what it is. <laughs> I've listened to interviews um, you've given before and, you know, your inspirations, uh, yeah, like you, you'll say you're inspired by Blade Runner or by this scientist or that scientist. And it's interesting because your work seems, I mean, it's probably the best compliment you can pay an artist, but your work seems the least derivative kind of artwork I've ever seen. I can't say, oh, that looks like he's inspired by uh, Manet or he was inspired by, you know, Albach or someone. It's, like, it's completely original. And, yeah, I, I think it, the work's just absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for that. And, and, and honestly, my just desires find the poetry in those patterns and algorithms and 
like what is hidden there? Like what we can bring it out on the surface mm. and bring depth to surface. I notice that after a certain amount of time in quantum memories, the algorithms that generate the image um, are displayed on the screen. And why is it important for you to show the process? Because that's something uh, typically most artists avoid. It is my obsession. Like since I understand the power of AI, since I learned that how important to share, because AI is a very powerful tool and AI is not something we can have a joke about it. AI is something I believe I'm in a very positive mood and I always like keep my positivity and hope. And I believe humanity will be the smart move and will always keep the integrity ethics beyond, you know, monetization of certain things. But at the meantime, AI means our privacy and free will is on stake. Mm -hmm. So um, I felt my responsibility to explain which algorithm we use, how we use, which data we use. I'm very open in my process. And I think it felt, it, by the way, I have many copycats. Like I have a really, really copycat does exactly what I do in a couple of months. And I mean, it's okay. Like I'm seeing these people and, you know, I'm not a gatekeeper of any idea, but you know, this creates those problems because you share so much and then maybe the technique of the artwork is now exposed to everyone and it, it's okay. I think it's, it's the idea. It's the idea of like freshness comes from something else, not like mimicking a technique. So I feel like the process is incredibly important to share. And and sometimes I understand like some art critic says, oh, like I now love everything about it. It's not anymore art. It's just this another like a screensaver or like, I mean, I understand this reflection, but I think it's too old school. I'm sorry. It's like a dinosaur, you know, memories. And then it's just the opposite. It's the opposite. The art is changing. It's Renaissance. It's completely deconstructing the old world. And then we're reconstructing a new world. And I can, I don't believe the old biased, like context and discourse works anymore. That's absolutely fascinating. So you, you see the technology that you're using as being a part of this bigger story of the sort of technological innovation and AI, which obviously it is. But I love that you're, the reason you're about transparency isn't just because, you know, it's not about this sort of pretentious mysticism about your technique, which so many artists um, are into, but you're actually, you actually think it's an important cultural thing to assert that we need to be transparent about how AI works. And in, in order for us to have a optimistic outlook on the technological age, we need to completely understand how it works. Is that correct? Absolutely. And this is one of the reasons I'm feeling like the honestly opening that gates of knowledge and experience is where I found the open and honest connection with my audience. I would not feel honest and connected when I'm not, I'm hiding all the techniques behind it or the name of an algorithm or why and how I do it. Like I share so much. And I mean, sometimes honestly, like my team's like, wow, like you share all these things. Like, and then yes, I mean, it's not for a gatekeeping. It's about like push the humanity's next journey and in a way that we can be a part of it or not. I mean, if someone doesn't have a moral, they will do the same thing. It's okay. It's their moral, it's their ethics, it's their value system. It's not us. <laughs> we find the other idea and even we just go somewhere else. It's easy. So I find that incredible. So my concern, you're the you're the least egotistical artist I've ever met. <laughs> I mean, I I I don't know where, how else we can move somewhere new. Mm. Why did you remove humans from the photos that you sourced for quantum memories? For respectfully, I found that at least in my practice, I'm very focusing on collective memories in general. I'm trying my very best to not to touch any personal moment in life. And it's pretty clear that if you look at the history of photography, the human point of view, of course, this is a moment in life is very personal. But if you are recording a building in New York or like if AI is learning from someone's point of view of a building in multiple seasons and time and, you know, different, you know, condition of light, when AI learns that it's not anymore someone's memory, it's a collective memory. So I'm trying to create that collective memory. Like how can we look at the same context and perspective of life from multiple views and reconstruct them with AI? And how can we find those collective memories like space, nature, and time is my practice focus. You were almost trying to create then uh, internet as nature and because I almost see the internet as the new sort of uh, wild or you know nature that we can sort of dip our uh, you know dip into and dip out of uh, on a what, daily basis or uh, minute by minute basis I know that you're a fan of uh, Blade Runner as we said before and I wonder whether the blackout that takes place between Blade Runner 1 and 2 made you a bit nervous about your uh -huh. own work being lost in a global power outage 
So I feel like any Blade Runner nerd friends are very itchy about the, the of course, the 2049. Mm-hmm. But maybe I miss so much that I appreciate so much. Like I don't have that critical eye that finds all the like logical problems or like emotional problems. I felt connected. I felt good about it. Maybe I'm living in Los Angeles, by the way, because of the movie, <laughs> very open mm-hmm. thing. Uh, it was 2000, uh, I don't know, it was 2012 that I moved to LA nine years ago. And I just couldn't forget that feeling in my eight years old when I watched the movie. And I'm still feeling that feeling. Like I, I have still the same feeling, like seeing that near future flying car next to a beautiful facade. I mean, that vision is incredibly powerful. Um, and they just- kept that power. But dystopian at the same time. It is dystopian, but I mean, still there's a hope in the second one, especially mm. I can say the emotions are incredible. I mean, I mean, the idea of like, what can a machine do with someone else's memories is just an incredible question to me. Mm. And especially when to a sentient machine talking like <laughs> saying that it's not your memory, it's someone else's memories. It's an incredible dialogue. It's a very powerful moment. And also like reproduction of like an AI and like, you know, uh, emotional expectation from each other. I mean, these are like a very remarkable theories of near future, theories of near future. And, but I'm also like very, I guess, feeling that when I watch these movies, it feels like a remembering the future. It's like, you know, very nostalgia, like a future nostalgia is happening in my mind. Like, I feel like I'm there. I know this, like I went there. Perhaps because you watched it as a, as a, young boy and so despite it being set in the future you you remember it as something in the past by the way yeah most likely and then I, I got this very unique um dialogue between a, a friend who has been practicing um psychedelics and incredible neuroscientific research he said because i was so young i reflect something very positive even though it was not because i was just so like eight years old my belief system and the constructed reality is based on very most likely positive conditions mm. so i reflect a very positive condition to the blade under itself so it doesn't like click to me a dystopian negative narrative that's interesting as well i mean because i've watched blade runner 2049 multiple times now and i almost watch it because it's just a pleasant film to watch despite it being so so sinister and dystopian mm. totally agree with you but surely but Still, I wonder, I mean, how well backed up is your artwork back to the original question of this? Because surely the ephemeral nature of uh, digital work makes you nervous. I mean, if there was a global power outage, would all your artwork be stored safely? I think that's a good question. And I want to jump to like um, very openly to the world of, I guess, NFTs. Because NFTs are an incredible new blockchain and the metaverse context is becoming very important. Mm -hmm. To me, like what is very inspiring is, at least in my humble view, is now we have a major shift. Another renaissance happening at the moment. So 2018, one of my collectors, I'm very fortunate that since 2012, I have collectors in the world. And this collector was 2018 who collected the mounting memories. And he was saying hey, like I'm investing in cryptocurrencies and I would like to mint your artwork into blockchain. Can you please let me do that? And there's no value attached. I just want to feel secure that your artwork survives forever. Wow, like, wait, this is an amazing concept because like it's every artist like dream to be sure that the artwork doesn't like, you know, go away. And and that's how I learned about NFTs. And, and the rest is history. Like uh, almost more than a year ago, I got reached by uh, one of the NFT, you know, uh, platforms called Nifty Gateway. And it was very early days, like, you know, last year, maybe February, like very, very early days. And then I said, wow, what is this? And then I said, you know, like this is, this is the most likely an even movement. And then your collector back in time who made this is now becoming a practice. And, and last, I think, November, I did my first auction and first drop. It's called drop, by the way, in the language, in the culture. And I met with fascinating people. It's an incredible culture. It's a beautiful community. And yes, like anything new has a ramification. Yes, there are problems. Yes, um, there are ethical issues. There are like financial issues. There are like playing with the you know, human psychological systems. And so, but the community itself, the people around that is incredible. Um, 
deeply respect Finga Beepu, one of the person who sold for $70 million at Christie's, and Murat Pak, another fantastic friend who made a remarkable journey. I mean, these are my like friends, you know, like they're friends. And I just like connected to these people and connect. And then it was amazing. It was really amazing. And then um, I found myself powerfully connected with something bigger than me. And I found that it's completely giving a value to my work more than ever. So I'm just deeply grateful. Um, yes, there's an ecological impact. Yes, there are some problems like blockchain means certain con- like a proof of work um, networks can create a major impact on the ecological system. So that's, I think, the only downside of so far. And I'm seeing like a manipulation a lot, like meaning just the value is not always given to the, you know, rightfully. We are seeing some, you know, not, I don't know, how it's, not balanced <laughs> reaction to certain conditions. But for me, it was for me and the studio, it was remarkable. Um, as you know, like we are a 14 people studio and we are like, uh, we can speak 14 languages, represent 10 countries in my studio. And for us, this economical model, the freedom of, you know, of practice is incredible. Um, so I'm grateful. Is there any particular reason why everyone in your studio speaks 10 different languages? Or like, is that something you deliberately look for someone speaking another language when you hire them? Um, it is. It is a very straightforward reason. I want a multinational, multicultural environment because I, I do not believe it's possible other way to make art for anyone, any age, any background in the world. It's not mm-hmm. honest. Like if a bunch of group of people in a limited culture cannot have the vision of like everyone in the world, I don't believe it's possible. That's <laughs> um, fascinating. And because uh, I've always, I mean, a lot of artists from history uh, seem to be able to speak multiple languages. And I've often had this suspicion that it's because they're the reason why they're so good as an artist is because they they also have this ability to uh, speak another language. It's a way of, although it's verbal, it's almost like a substitute for being able to see the world differently. I think so. I mean, also like the beauty is comes from the collaboration across like disciplines, mm. minds and cultures and souls. I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm never want to be an egocentric, you know, person that enjoys things that I do myself or I never just, I don't know. I, maybe I don't enjoy seeing my own capacity myself that is so limited. Mm. I don't feel that achieving uncharted territories can be done by just one mind. I don't believe that. I, I, I don't believe there is a power in one mind. I mean, we are all eternally connected. I think we, I think humanity operates together. <laughs> so if they're like a machine, it's a whole community in humanity. So I think I also like there is a beautiful proverb, African proverb, which says, if you're going to go faster, do it alone. But if you're going to go further, do it together. So I believe to go further than going quick. That's amazing. It's really refreshing, uh, especially for the sort of the heights that you've reached at such an early age. It's really refreshing to hear someone with that uh, that approach. Um, do you think Denis Villeneuve is the greatest director alive at the moment? Again, please. Do you think Denis Villeneuve, uh, director of Blade Runner twenty forty nine and a few other films, do you think he's the best director alive at the moment? Ooh, or who's or who's yeah. your favourite director working at the moment? I mean, oof, very hard question. I mean, Alejandro Inhari too, mm. like he very hard to like, I mean, there are Spielberg is one of my hero. Ridley Scott is a hero. James mm. Cameron is a hero. Like, um, I don't know. Like these are like pretty well like first. I mean, like Tarkovsky, I'm mm. inspired by like Solaris, like many, I mean, it's just, yeah, I wouldn't say I have one, but I have multiple. I mean, Christopher, Christopher Nolan, I mean, Inception is an incredible mm. movie. It's still like I cannot forget that, how incredibly it constructed itself, how genius it is. Like, um, mm. I, often like think that, <laughs> yeah, I often think that um, directing, I mean, probably for the last 100 years, directing has been, or cinema is going to be remembered in the same way we sort of remember the Renaissance. You know, it was uh, not just because they're so, you know, it's such an amazing art form, but because... It's sort of like the the technological or the work is dependent on technological innovation and so it's so sort of associated with a particular time. And I just think in, you know, 500 years when we look back at this time in history, I think people have Villeneuve and Inaritu and 
um, Francis Ford Coppola are just going to be seen as sort of the Michelangelo's of their time. Uh, absolutely, I believe that. I mean, very openly saying one of the reasons I'm just using this AI cinema or latent cinema keywords is very openly because of the cinema, my desire of, I mean, when I did my first immersive environment, 2000, almost 10, um, I just was very openly like the whole narrative and the technique of saying story with multiple projectors or my first research for immersive environment was expanded cinema, a book that I'm in love with, a book that transformed my practice um, is just remarkable. I cannot forget how people push the boundaries of cinema beyond just two dimensional universe. And, and I'm trying to follow their, you know, pets and footprints and just be sure that, you know, respectfully again, understanding who made and when and how, and I'm asked the question, like, how can I go beyond what, where we are? Like, how can we reach that new mountains and new, you know, would you, would you consider yourself a director then? Because I guess that's, I mean, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. I'm also calling like, I mean, media artists, yes, because I'm practicing with art, of course, when I'm using any sort of media in my practice and software and code and, you know, algorithms and custom softwares. But directing is a much sometimes accurate because I'm working across disciplines like a music, architecture, literature, um, AI, neuroscience, and, you know, material logistics and, mm. and so on, computer graphics. So it's kind of like a directing a whole beautiful, like orchestrating, like an incredible minds together to imagine and go somewhere together. Um, it's so not different for directing a movie sometimes. And it's as, you know, simple as you have an outcome and narrative to tell and explain to design that feels real, but it's not real. Especially, especially in a logistical sense. I imagine your work would be very much like a director's. I'm, I'm sure you've seen renderings of the world map that show the path of the COVID outbreak at some stage in the last two years. They almost reminded me of your work Interconnected, which just for the listeners was uh, based off the data of air traffic. Have you, you, have you used any data points relating to the pandemic for recent work? Yes. Last year, unfortunately, uh, when the pandemic became more realistically problem problem for humanity, we got an incredible call from a Georgia Tech professor, um, and um, it was for Atlantic. Um, and he basically commissioned us to speculate COVID memorial. And we designed a COVID data sculpture as a memorial, um, data memorial, basically. Um, it was just a very powerful moment. And I just thought that such a horrible idea to turn human into a point like how it was so sad that right now, when we look at the public data, we are just a point um, on a geolocation. I felt like very, like heavily hit. You know, one night I was waiting, the algorithm was plotting, 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 plotting. Like all these points were someone we lost. It was heavy. It was very heavy. You were trying to turn um, deaths from a statistic into a tragedy. Oh, I was so heavy. I, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I am not connected with that project, to be honest, because of the mentally, I felt very much shockingly not enjoyed at all. Like, I don't want to like think about how to represent a human with a point and a line and aesthetics. I mm. felt like myself like, no, that's, that's, but at the meantime, that's a reality. Like it was very hard. It was very hard to fight with that feeling. It's interesting how sort of desensitized to the pandemic we've become. Because I mean, if you'd said at the start of 2020, before the pandemic sort of um, really, uh, you know, became what it did, you, you would have said, "Oh, if four million people were going to die uh, in the next two years, you'd think that would be, you know, uh, psychologically well-changing event that you know would scar everyone." And I just feel. Uh, because it's sort of almost happened so gradually or something, it's it's lost its tragic flavor. But um, mm. talking about, I mean, sorry, go on. I mean, like literally when we look at the total deaths, like we lost 4.6 million people as, as, as if right now we are recording mm-hmm. this talk. I mean, plotting more than 1 million people's like lost in a human, I mean, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a global map. I don't know who can, I, I don't know. I don't know how to justify this 
moment to myself to make ethically. I don't know. It was very heavy. Sorry. Mm, no, don't apologize. Um, it's, it's really impressive, actually, to sort of see you taking that taking that approach. Talking about good art is often a conversation about what solutions were found to express this or that kind of a thing. But I think that some of the most interesting conversations with artists are when they explain what they failed to achieve or why a potential solution failed to work. Has this ever happened in your career and why didn't the potential solution work? Can I have a question? Can I have one more time? Sorry, mm-hmm. it was cut. Uh, talking about good art is often a conversation about what solutions were found to express this or that kind of a thing. But I think that some of the most interesting conversations with artists are when they explain what they failed to achieve or why a potential solution failed to work. Has this ever happened to you in your career and why did the potential solution not work? Hmm, it's an interesting question. I think I would not say a pot not works like okay. So it was 2013. Mm-hmm. I was on a stage with my shorts at Microsoft Research. I was a student and I was just very excited. I had eight minutes to share my dream. And the question was: can a building learn? Can it dream? And this question was very direct and very honest, but I didn't know how to answer that. And I got my first, I mean, significant award from Microsoft Research, Best Vision Award, a remarkable funding and academic support. And there I found that actually I have an idea, I had an idea, I didn't know where to go. That was like unlocking that path very clearly. So I had like, I think the opposite of what you are saying, but I, I found that I always able I was able, always able to find those unlocking points of things may not go c- well if you don't have that solution. You know like it can be just another beautiful idea in the mind. But that's it. I guess what I want to say is I try to define what is success to me very early ages. I mean for me success was making dream to reality. And as long as I was creating a dream to reality, I was feeling successful. It's not money driven. It's not fame, ego, whatever those like cliche world of like now currencies. I was just like a different mindset. And and eventually when we think that for me again, art is humanity's capacity of imagination. And if it was, if it was my responsible to push the edge of like imagination and I found that dream is there. So it's a very interesting vicious circle, if I may say that I found myself like going to the edge, finding the dream. And like, I hope the circle always close, but I couldn't find a disconnection yet to your answer, to answer you, I guess. It's almost like the nature of your work or your approach to your work is that you ask questions that you don't have the answer to yet or are almost impossible to answer. Yeah. I mean, there are some challenging questions again, that many people are running away, but it's consciousness. Again, can we touch our memories and dreams? Um, can we reconstructing a memory? Can we use AI in a world that can unfold the invisible world of alternative like dimensions in the mind of a machine or a quantum state? I mean, there are so many incredible questions in life that we know that is beautifully unknown to, for us to creative, we stay creative. <laughs> mm. Well, that follows on to my last question then. Uh, why do you think art is important? Again, it is for me, art is humanity's capacity of imagination. And I think artists are representing that capacity for entire humanity. And I felt myself always responsible to ask that question. And from any perspective, I think art can also heal us. Art can let us know who we are and remind us, ground us connect us, warn us. Like I know some art is incredibly purposeful and impactful for certain conditions about how technology can be in the wrong conditions can make more problems. It's about our ethics, our free will, privacy. And there are so many incredible potentials of art that opens up new questions. And I know there's some signs inspired from art. And I know that at the same time, of course, art is completely inspired from the science as well. Mm -hmm. It's a symbiotic relationship. And I think most importantly, for me, art is this generative language of mind 
like universal language of mind that I know that exists. Even I don't know maybe language of some kind of culture or group of people, I know that the art I make may have a chance to connect with someone's mind and soul at the same time. And that is to me the true, pure magic and power of imagination. Well, on that note, I think we can end the conversation. And uh, thanks so much for your time, Rafiq. And as I said, I've uh, very quickly become a massive fan of your work and uh, really, uh, really impressed by it. So thanks for coming on and um, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful questions and dialogue.